please welcome Paul Greenberg, author of Four Fish and American Catch. Hello. Uh, so this is the time for the tiny seafood slice of the larger food pie. The tiny slice that comes from 71% of the Earth's surface and 95% of its volume. Um, I have a little chip on my shoulder. I was recently, I saw Michael Pollan this summer, and, uh, and I was looking at Michael, and he said, well, Michael's looking good. And, uh, you know, he's just, he just looked really trim and fit and everything. And, uh, and then I started, got to think about it, and I was thinking about sort of, what does this say about me, but, or what does it say about our food system? And I thought about it, 200 pounds of land food meats per person per year in this country, um, as opposed to 15 pounds of seafood per person. Uh, in this country. And then I thought, well, maybe that sort of plays out in Michael's royalties and my royalties. I was just, just sheer, sheer speculation, nothing to do with the quality of the writing. But anyway, let's talk about this little slice. Um, so this slide here, um, these are your neighbors. These are the fish that swim in our local waters. And as a kid growing up, um, this was my team. Um, I was rotten at sports. I didn't like to play them. I didn't like to watch them. Um, so this is my team. I went fishing. I went fishing in the waters around uh, Long Island Sound and the New York Bight. Um, I grew up on the coast of Connecticut. Um, but as I moved through life, I went to college um, and came back to fishing, I found that my team had gone from this to this, that the waters had really radically changed in a very few years. And it got me thinking about sort of what was going on in the oceans in general. And I realized that when I went to fish markets, um, instead of seeing this great panoply of different species on ice, more and more, I kept seeing this repetition of four things. Thank you, Michael Pollan. But again, four things, tuna, shrimp, salmon, cod, again and again and again. And I thought, huh, that's a really weird subset. How did we end up with that? Well, I realized it wasn't because, whereas I thought of all these things as my team, most of America thought of these things like this that they didn't really see species at all. They saw what I like to think of as flesh archetypes. Um, four, four pieces of flesh. And, and when you think about this, not only Michael Pollan is, is saying this, but this is true of the way humans behave with the natural world. If you look at the land food meats, um, all different, if you look at the um, fire pits of Neolithic humans, you'll see dozens and dozens of mammals in their fire pits telescope to today and you get four, right? Cattle, pigs, sheep, goats. Um, same thing is true of birds. Um, I was uh, recently um, having a, a chat with Mark Kurlansky, the author of Cod, and he at the time was working on a book about oysters, as you might remember, the big oyster, and he had old menus from New York City, um, and he was showing me the poultry section. He says, look at all these birds on the menu. Um, you know, snipe, woodcock, grouse, many different kinds of water ducks, but again, telescope to the age of modern animal husbandry, and you have four, chickens, turkeys, ducks, and geese. So it happens again and again, this kind of purification and simplification of the system. Well, how is it happening and how has it happened specific with seafood? Well, if you look at just the very, very recent history of the exploitation of the ocean in the last 70 years, really since World War II, um, you'll see just this huge exponential growth in harvest of wild seafood from the sea, going from about um, 20 million metric tons just around World War II to around 80 to 90 million metric tons. And that's really leveled off um, in the last few years. Um, and that's a lot of fish. Um, that's the equivalent to the human weight of China taken out of the sea each and every year. And it's no surprise that I'm comparing it to China because China is actually the largest harvester of wild seafood in the world. And as the Times reported this year, um, China has actually lost about 60% of its coastal wetlands to development. These are the places where seafood is born. So no wonder they're developing a deep water, distant water fleet. Well, that's just half the picture because when you look at the seafood profile, there's this other thing that's going on that's really, really new, and that's the rise of what's called aquaculture, fish farming, mariculture, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it is the fastest growing animal production system on the planet. It's growing at 7% per year. If somebody wanted to create a fund around it, you certainly could do so with those kinds of market returns. Um, and again, if you look at who's growing all this fish, well, it's China. China is also the fat, largest grower of seafood in the world. And if you were to add up the amount of wild seafood and farm seafood that's being produced in the world right now, it's the equivalent of two Chinas of human weight taken out of the oceans each and every year. 
And by the way, this is one of the reasons why the United States, which actually has the third largest seafood footprint in the world, um, imports something like 85 to 90 percent of our seafood from abroad. So it, a lot of it is coming from China. Um, so let's look at our choices as, as Americans. Number one by far most consumed seafood in America is shrimp. Um, shrimp is a really tricky ecological choice. In the wild, when we catch shrimp, um, huge bycatch rates that, that is unintended, unintentionally caught and landed seafood. Um, sometimes five pounds of unintentional stuff for every pound of shrimp, sometimes 10 pounds in really bad fisheries, sometimes 15 pounds of other stuff killed for our pound of shrimp. Um, it's also very fuel inefficient. Um, there was a recent paper that came out of Dalhousie in Canada that showed that uh, dragging the bottom for crustaceans is one of the most fuel intensive things you can do in the fishing sphere. So we think, well, why not farm them? Um, and we do. And a lot of the shrimp coming to us, more than half is coming to us from farms right now. Problem is they come from places uh, like this slide. This is a, a photograph I took uh, in a mangrove forest in Vietnam. And mangrove forests are really great uh, production zones for biological activity, uh, place for fish and shrimp to rear, places for uh, coastal protection. Um, and this is where a lot of shrimp ponds are dug. And after they get through with it, um, it tends to look like this. And so we've lost millions and millions of acres of coastal mangrove forests to shrimp development. People speculate that uh, Typhoon Haiyan that hit the Philippines that really devastated it. One of the reasons it was so devastating was that there were very little mangroves to protect the coastline. So uh, the other thing that's going on with shrimp farming is, and this is not true of all shrimp farming, there's certainly ecologically you know, sensitive shrimp farming, but a lot of what goes into shrimp farms are what are called trash fish. Fish that are caught up in these trawls ground up, turned into pellet feed, and fed back to the shrimps. So in the worst case scenario, you have a, an ecology that's basically eating its own guts, eating itself, to produce more and more shrimp largely for export. And to make things triply worse, um, probably you guys saw some of these investigations that first came from The Guardian, then the Associated Press. A lot of these trash fish boats, um, in, particularly in Thailand, are being manned by slaves. So it's a huge ecological and moral price we're paying when we go for shrimp, cheap shrimp. Next seafood that we consume the most is tuna. So tuna, um, we think of it, a lot of people don't even really understand what it is. Um, bluefin tuna can be over 1,000 pounds. Uh, my friend Carl Safina uh, was once asked, well, how do they get it into the can then? Um, but <laughs> you, the stuff you hear about fish, you wouldn't believe. Um, but so tuna, tuna actually come from, are harvested from these vast management areas called regional fisheries management organizations. There are 14 of them around the world. Um, huge amounts of territory that have to be covered uh, by managers in order to make sure that they are um, farmed so-called sustainably. Um, there are huge problems with this. A lot of tuna catches come from what are, what are called the high seas, international waters that are pretty much owned by no one. Um, our own particular I, uh, RFMO is ICAT, the International Convention for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas. My good friend Carl Safina calls it, or used to call it, the international conspiracy to catch all the tuna. Um, <laughs> they've improved their management, and many of the RFMOs are improving their management. But nevertheless, you're harvesting from just a vast swath of ocean to get our can of tuna. So why not farm them? Well, big problem. Um, tuna are really like the predators, like the tigers of the sea. Um, they can swim at over 40 miles an hour. Um, they are warm-blooded. Uh, the yellowfin, the bluefin, the big eye tuna can all heat their blood 20 degrees above ambient. So this cancels out whatever benefit you have from farming a fish. You know, fish are cold-blooded. Fish float. They're docile normally. So why would you take the super fast predator and turn it into a farmed animal? Well, people are doing it, uh, particularly in the Mediterranean where they're ranching, and it can take 20 pounds of wild fish to produce a single pound of farmed tuna. So next creature, salmon. We all eat salmon. I eat salmon. Um, comes to us uh, in, in a strange way because of a series of catastrophes, um, but has become our third most consumed seafood in America. So um, salmon we actually used to have nearby in my home state of Connecticut. And if you take a look at my home state of Connecticut now, um, it kind of looks like Connecticut has the measles. Um, but actually, every dot on that map of Connecticut is a dam. There are 3,000 dams, at least 3,000 dams in the state of Connecticut alone. And um, I always say, this is why people in Connecticut are so uptight. You know, if, if, if 
Connecticut's chi is blocked. If somebody could just unblock Connecticut's chi. Um, I made that remark at a National Park Service uh, meeting, and a, a guy from North Carolina sidled up to me and says, says, you know, you ought, to, you ought not be so hard on Connecticut, because we in North Carolina, we have 35,000 dams. So in fact, there are millions and millions of these little structures that block rivers, that block the things um, that bring us salmon to us. Salmon need rivers to spawn in, and if you block them with a dam, they can't get there. So nevertheless, in spite of all the damming we've done, we still actually produce quite a bit of salmon in this country, hundreds of millions of pounds every year, but we export 80% of it. Now the weird thing is, some of it goes through this very strange process. We catch it mostly in Alaska, that's where our wild salmon comes from. We then send it whole abroad uh, to China, or Thailand, or Indonesia. There it is defrosted, boned, pin bones are taken out. It's refrozen, turned around, and sent back to us here in America, double frozen. I, I made this, talked about this on, on Fresh Air, and, and Terry Gross was like, uh, my mother always said not to double freeze fish. And I was like, yeah, that's true, Terry. Um, absolutely true. Um, you shouldn't double freeze fish, but that's what we're doing. And if, I know people are asking, well, how do I get the single frozen salmon? I have no idea. Um, so meanwhile, salmon um, come to us then mostly through farming. And a lot of it is farmed in Chile, which is, by the way, where it's an exotic, an, an introduced species in Chile. In the early days of salmon farming, it could take six pounds of wild fish to bring a pound of salmon to the market. Um, the industry has really gone through some tremendous reforms. They've gotten it below two pounds um, of, of wild fish per every pound of salmon. Some say they've gotten below one pound. Uh, it depends how you weigh a pellet and how many fish are in a pellet, how you make that calculation. Um, but the problem is we're farming so much salmon that the overall amount of what are called forage fish is not going down. It continues to go up and continues to be a major ecological issue in my opinion. But we're not just feeding fish to fish. We're also feeding a tremendous amount of fish to chickens and pigs. So I often wonder, so you have this chicken, um, it eats a fish, but what the uh, fish farming industry will never tell you is that you also have fish that eat chickens. And just I always wonder, was, is there ever been a chicken or fish that ate chicken that ate a fish? <laughs> it's just something to wonder. <laughs> kind of throws the whole chicken and egg thing on its head. Um, Nevertheless, what this comes down to is that we're taking between 20 and 30 million metric tons, of, you know, a fifth or a th to a third of the world catch in forage fish and using them for weird things like animal feed, pet feed. Um, and that's equivalent to a third of a China or the entire human weight of the United States taken out of the sea every single year for that purpose. Um, the last sort of of our four is, is white fish. And this is something that used to be called cod, but the industry has developed this term whitefish. And I like to use the example of the McDonald's filet of fish sandwich and the transition it went through. So the first filet of fish sandwich came from halibut. And um, when the franchise owner, owner um, uh, he was in Cleveland, and he found that nobody was coming into his store on Friday. They were Catholic, so they needed a fish burger. And he wanted to have a fish burger, and he actually made a bet with Ray Kroc because Ray Kroc also had a sandwich idea. He had this concept of the hula burger. It was going to be a slice of pineapple on a bun. I mean, it was the 60s. Hawaii was cool, you know, Mad Men, that kind of thing. And um, so he had a bet. Whose sandwiches sells better, you know, wins the bet? Well, the franchise owner won. And the only thing is that Ray Kroc said, I don't want that halibut sandwich. That's a 27 cent, 27 cent sandwich. I want a 25 cent sandwich. So he used uh, a 25 cent fish Atlantic cod. And we all know what's happened to Atlantic cod in New England. I mean, there are actually still healthy populations of cod out there, particularly off Iceland and Norway, um, but we don't have a lot of domestic East Coast cod anymore. Now the filet of fish sandwich, though, is not made out of cod. It's now made out of Alaska pollock. Alaska pollock is one of these fish that nobody knows. It's the, it's the fake crab that um, you might recall in Curb Your Enthusiasm. Remember, um, Cheryl breaks up with Larry because during sex he can't stop talking about the difference between fake crab and real crab. So that's, that's Pollock. Um, that's the biggest food fish, fin fish fishery in the United States right now, two to three million, billion pounds every single year. But even that is proving not enough for the white fish industry. And that's why we've ended up with this fish, the tilapia, which 20 years ago I think nobody here ever ate. Um, I once asked a fish farmer, um, when he first heard of tilapia, and he said, well, you know, the first time I heard of it was about 20 years ago, I thought it was a stomach disease. Um, but it's not a stomach disease, it's actually a very 
Environmentally friendly fish, it grows really fast, it goes from eggs to, egg to an adult in nine months. Um, uh, you know, so much so that it's now, you see, you, it's, it's one of these fish that really, really seems to, you know, inspire a lot of confidence. The thing is, is that what the tilapia doesn't give us, it doesn't give us the omega-3 you know, EPA and DHA um, that we are looking for when we look for in fish. So what should we eat? What sh where do we go from here? Complicated question. Um, one thing we could do is we could eat these forage fish directly. Um, you know, who's going to you know, speak up for these fish unless we eat them? These fish can't speak up for themselves because they're from an order, a uh, family called Clupeidae. Um, they communicate mostly through farting, believe it or not. Um, so these fish are not going to speak for themselves. So if we ate them, perhaps we could speak for them. Um, they are extremely fuel efficient. Um, small pelagics are very, very efficient to harvest, um, require the fewest amount of um, fuel calories to burn to bring to market. And potentially, what if we were to cut the amount that we caught and fed to animals? What if we cut it in half and just ate them directly, gave the fishermen twice as much money for half as much fish? Interesting concept. Um, these fish are also very high in omega-3s. So there's, if you believe in that, there's that for you. Um, Another thing, though, we could do that would probably be even smarter than forage fish would be to eat bivalves. Um, the mussel has, if we were to farm mussels on a huge scale, um, mussels are, are very high in omega-3s. They are um, as high as most canned tuna. Um, they also are extremely fuel efficient to bring to market, um, a fraction of what, say, cattle, I think a 30th of what cattle cost to bring to market. Um, they also require no forage fish uh, when you farm them. In fact, the way they live is by making our environment cleaner. The average mussel can uh, filter at least a dozen, if not more, gallons of water per mussel per day. And this is extremely important given what we're up against. There, the phenomenon of nitrification and phosphorification of the oceans is causing dead zones, oxygen-free areas or oxygen-low areas around the world. Now, there are now 400 major dead zones around the world. Well, surprise, shellfish actually help remove nitrogen from the water and therefore lessen the potential impact of dead zones. Another thing we could eat is kelp. I mean, we were talking about the difference between meat and vegetables uh, just now. Well, what about sea vegetables? You don't have to water them. And in a place, in a time where we have, have really serious issues about fresh water, this stuff grows like crazy. It grows really fast. Um, and also, I'm surprised it also strains a lot of water, not exactly filtering it, but it makes it, it denitrifies water by using them as nutrients and taking them out of the water when we eat them. Um, this is a great thing too, because we could also possibly use things like kelp as forage for cattle. So if we want to keep eating beef, instead of feeding them corn and soy, we potentially could fatten them on something that doesn't need to be watered. The last thing is sort of a mystery. So it's the mystery fish. There are, I realize everybody here is not going to eat a mussel or a piece of kelp. I understand that. There are dedicated flesh eaters in here. And we're going to probably continue to farm fish. And it's not necessarily a bad thing to farm fish if we can figure it out. In fact, you know, somebody from Santa Barbara, a professor there, was telling me recently that a lot of times people go into the supermarket or in the restaurant and they're so confused about, oh, should I have this fish, that fish? Oh, I don't know if it's sustainable. Blah. You know what? Screw it. I'll just have the steak. Worst environmental choice they can make if it's industrially farm steak because um, by and large, the average piece of seafood is orders of magnitude less carbon than putting a piece of beef in the center of your plate. So if we're going to farm these fish, though, they're going to need to be vegetarian. We want to cut that huge tranche of forage fish out of their diet so that we can bring them to market by creating a net, uh, a, a net supply of fish rather than having a deduction of other fish to feed the farm fish that we like. Um, we'd like it to be fast growing, like the tilapia goes from egg to adult in nine months. The quicker we move them through the system, the less energy intensive they are. Um, we would like them to be adaptable. Climate change is upon us. Salmon might not always do the trick if waters are getting warmer and warmer. Salmon like cold water. And finally, we'd like to have them to have the oily fish profile. This is the trickiest thing of all because you know tilapia and other things, catfish and things like that, are fed on corn and soy just like other farmed animals. But if you want something to have an oily fish profile, you have to feed them something oily. There are alternative feeds being developed out there. And if there are any entrepreneurs in the world, room, any investors in the room, look at alternative feeds. This is something we desperately need. It exists, but it is not scaling up. People keep saying, oh, we're going to scale that up soon. When is it going to scale up? We got to scale this up. So, in conclusion, this is what we're eating right now. But my feeling is if we saw this more as the center of our plate, 
then we might have more of this in the sea. So thank you.